Data, it's everywhere. The water cooler conversations your customers used to have are now public on social media. So how can you best use it? and what mistakes can marketers avoid? I'm Daniel Burstein, Director of Editorial Content and Marketing Sherpa. I'm joined now by Ginger Conlin, Editor-in-Chief of Direct Marketing News. Thanks for joining us, Ginger. <laughs> Thanks so, for having me. So we were talking briefly about your biggest pet peeve when it comes to data and when it comes to marketing. What, what is that? So my biggest pet peeve right now is the obsession with millennials. Now, don't mistake that you, I'm saying that is it the baggy pants? What is it? Right. <laughs> it's not that you shouldn't be paying attention to millennials as marketers. You absolutely should, but stop generalizing that all millennials are the same. Right? They should be segmented the way that you would segment any other audience member that you know or group that you have in your set of customers. So, what sets them apart? What makes them different? You have this data. You can get so much data. Use that data to then speak to different millennial customers differently because especially the, the variety of ages or the span of ages that make up millennials, you've got some who are younger, some who are older, that some who have family, some don't. You know, So talk to them differently. Don't just keep obsessing over the broad, general millennial. Yeah. So now that said, I'm going to broadly generalize millennials, right? Okay. <laughs> but uh, the, the one thing about, I mean, really more the time we live in than a specific age group is, like I said, we share these conversations publicly that we only used to share privately. So how can marketers and, and what, what companies are you seeing like really dive into that big data and find ways to segment millennials with that data? Oh, that's a good question. Well, so companies that are out there, um, we just, in the, in the magazine that you held up, we just did an article about Jaguar. Now that's not necessarily millennials, but one of the things that they found was that they have two specific sets of buyers. So they have buyers who buy their $50,000 price range cars and buyers who buy their $100,000 price range cars. And those, they buy for completely different reasons. Obviously what they can afford is completely different. So they have to segment and target those audiences specifically in completely different ways to make the conversations relevant to those audiences. Um, going back to an example of using social media, uh, there's a company called Z Galleries, a furniture company. And what's interesting about what happened with them was they found that they do this print catalog that's just beautiful and glossy. So they found that their customers were photographing the catalog, the cover, the inside, um, and sometimes putting it out on their coffee table and photographing it as part of like the setup of their room to post on Pinterest to show their wish list of things from Z Galleries. So Z Galleries said, oh my God, you know, we have to harness this popularity that we didn't even realize we had. And they started doing some contests, getting people to, encouraging them to do more user-generated content around their catalog. As a result, sales increased, requests for the catalog increased. So just kind of creating a virtuous cycle of customers and prospects being engaged and then them the, and then them benefiting on the you know sales and an engagement side as well so you know sometimes it's just that what a cooler conversation as a matter of being out there and listening finding out where your customers are and what they're doing i mean they're you know this was their print catalog that's being socialized it's, that's it's awesome, amazing man. That's awesome. And I think that's a great example of some customer first marketing, right? They're creating something so valuable for the customer that the customer is sharing. I know in your Jaguar story, the marketer you interviewed talking about using the data to really put customers first, right? right. But on the flip side, what are some of the poor things? Why should marketers perhaps be locked up when in terms of using data? Oh, <laughs> well, it's funny that you say it that way because I recently had a conversation with Atik Shah, who's the new um, director of advanced, vice president of advanced analytics at Cox Automotive. and one of the things that he was saying was that there's so much information and data out there, especially on social, what he was saying was that it's um, what used to be implicit data that marketers had to try and figure out is now explicit because of all these conversations that are hap happening on social that marketers can tap into and be at the water cooler and listening. So what he said was that 
if market, marketers who try to use the excuse that they don't understand their customers should be locked up in a data jail because all that data is there and available, you just have to figure out how to get that, the data that you need. That's the hard part, right? Getting the right data through all that like vast array of data that's available. All of that noise, yeah, exactly. All right, well, and hopefully we can help uh, marketers who are watching help find the right data from all these interviews we're doing at and then, and, and maybe it's the get out of jail free card, so. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Ginger. Thanks for having me. And you can watch more of the interviews from and then at markingsherpa.com slash DMA to learn how to use data the right way.